Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very grateful to Mark and Robert for bringing together so many art historical bigwigs in one conference. You don't have to be an art historian or a fashionista to notice that one of the defining characteristics of the 17th and 18th century portrait, male and female, is elaborately powdered and pomaded hair, sometimes in the form of a neatly cropped and curled wig, sometimes worn tumbling to the waist or towering to the chandelier. Using these two portraits from the exhibition as our touchstones, I will attempt in 20 minutes to unpack the social, political, and aesthetic revolutions that got us from here to here, from the improbably lush dark curls of the 63-year-old King Louis XIV to the gravity-defying gray hair of 24-year-old Queen Marie Antoinette almost a century later. And unless otherwise noted, all of the images I'm showing you are from Versailles. Scholarly studies of hair have focused on its natural, anthropological, and corporeal properties. As historian Han Angela Rosenthal has written, emerging from the flesh and thus both of and without the body, hair occupies an extraordinary position between the natural and the cultural. But hair at the court of Versailles was never what you could call natural. Often it wasn't hair at all, at least not human hair, and if human, it was not the setter's own human hair as it was frequently obscured by powder, flowers, feathers, and other ornaments. Culture was everything, and hair was as laden with meaning as it was with ornamentation. The term bigwig was first recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1792. Though it must have been in use earlier in order to make its way into the lexicon, by that time it tended to be used humorously or contemptuously. Wigs were well on their way out of fashion in 1792 and worn only by the very old or conservative. Truly big wigs were retained well beyond their vogue for ceremonial occasions like the opening of parliament in the image above and by judges, male and female, in England, Australia, and many other Commonwealth countries below. Thus, though calling someone a big wig had a derogatory connotation, it was an accurate marker of status. By the time it came into general use, only venerable or influential men regularly wore big wigs. The fashion for wigs probably began, like so many others, with Louis XIV. As the king himself observed, there are nations where the majesty of the king consists in large part in never letting himself be seen. If there is one particular character of this monarchy, it is the free and easy access to the prince. His subjects had ample opportunity to gawk at their king at court and at public festivals, carousels, and performances. The king's visibility ensured that he was the leader of fashion, a role he embraced enthusiastically to promote the French textile trades as well as his own glory. Like most people, Louis dressed more conservatively as he got older, but he never lost sight of the power of fashion to influence and impress. As a young man, Louis was blessed with naturally thick, curly, dark blonde hair. Long hair was not considered a feminine ornament in the 17th century, but a mark of masculinity. Men had worn their hair long since the days of Samson and Delilah, apart from relatively brief intervals during the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, when long hair was viewed as the mark of the barbarian. Women had long hair too, of course, but only young unmarried girls wore it loose and uncovered. If a full head of hair was a sign of virility in men, then sporting a mane of long curly locks was equivalent to driving a red Ferrari. But what happened when a man began to lose his hair, as Louis did probably beginning in his late teens? Prior to the 17th century, wigs were only worn in exceptional circumstances to disguise baldness, not as an everyday accoutrement for men of all ages. Louis XIII was said to have worn a small wig or toupee, but it did not become a general fashion as it did with his successor. In his early portraits, as on the left, Louis' wig looks quite natural, but the Rigaud portrait, painted more than 30 years later on the right, shows a much larger, sculpted, and obviously artificial wig, indicating that wigs were no longer considered cosmetic devices, but important status symbols and fashion statements. Wigs were not supposed to fool anyone, instead functioning almost as garments. Men threw them over their shoulders when bowing, tied them in knots, accidentally set them on fire, and appreciated their warmth in the winter, but not in the summer. 
By 1673, wigs had become so ubiquitous that Louis incorporated the Parisian Guild of Barbers and Wig Makers, two professions that went hand in hand and often shared the same workspace. The text accompanying this print published in 1678 notes that the wigs we wear now are very informal. They are half frizzed and half curled, and not quite as long. Sorry. Not quite as long as last year's, indicating that fashions and wigs changed quickly from season to season and required constant updating. People noticed when artists got it wrong, as Robert has shown with respect to the Bernini bust. As a result, wigs are a very reliable method of dating portraits. From their early natural look, wigs began to fill out from the bottom up. Once they could get no fuller, they grew vertically. By 1700, when the Rigaud portrait was painted, they had separated into two distinct peaks. Notice, too, that the back of the wig, rarely visible in portraits, changed as dramatically as the front. Considering how often the French were at war under Louis XIV, it's not surprising that fashion often took inspiration from military dress. These men wear campaign wigs with sections either tied or knotted to keep them out of the way during battle. But their formal, elegant clothes indicate that they are weekend warriors at best. The round hat of the 17th century, seen on the left, was contorted into the three-cornered or tricorn style by the 1690s and became a staple of the male wardrobe for the next century. On the right, however, it is carried under one arm because it could not sit comfortably on the peaked wigs of the period. Such hats were called chapeau bras, or arm hats. In this tapestry cartoon depicting the wedding of Louis XIV's grandson, what I want you to notice is the royal guard with his back to us at the left. His ceremonial uniform is based on medieval dress and centuries out of date. There he is. But his hairstyle is the most modern in the group. Soldiers had begun to tie their hair back for convenience and hygiene in camp and on the battlefield. Within a few decades, the cumbersome long wig had virtually disappeared, and all men wore cues, either curled or covered by a black silk bag, as here. The bag wig was the height of fashion by the 1720s, and remained an essential element of formal dress until the Revolution. The bags themselves grew quite large, as you can see on the gentleman playing the harp in this detail, perhaps suggesting more hair than they actually contained. A few 18th century wigs with bags attached have survived. Even as shorter styles replaced long wigs, endless variety was possible through different arrangements of curls and ribbons. The decision to wear a wig was a momentous one for any man because it meant shaving his head. It was the only way to wear a wig comfortably and eliminated the persistent problem of lice. At home, a man would take off his wig and put on a soft cap or turban for warmth. Though ostensibly intended for casual at-home wear, these caps could be very ornate and expensive. Louis shaved off his mustache in around 1683, probably because it was going gray. What was left of his hair probably went gray too, but we'll never know for sure, because in all of his portraits he wears a lush brown wig. Indeed, he continued to wear brown wigs even as younger and more fashion-conscious men somewhat perversely began powdering their wigs white in deference to the king's presumably graying hair. In this portrait of Louis and his heirs that Mimi showed us, that's his son in the white wig, which is made of blonde hair to achieve the desired hue and then powdered. There is no evidence that Louis himself ever wore a powdered wig. The unusual three-dimensional wax portrait of the king on the left, taken from a mold of his face when he was 65 years old, is deceptive because the wig of real human hair has been bleached white by light exposure. The underside of the hair is dark brown. The same artist produced a more conventional gold-plated relief portrait in the show. Like the wig itself, hair powder clearly had multiple practical and symbolic functions. Powder was essentially a powdered perfume, heavily diluted with inexpensive starch. It was sold by perfumers, not hairdressers or wig makers. It seems to have functioned much as dry shampoo does today, but with an added aesthetic component. It acted as deodorant as well, an important consideration in an age when bathing was considered eccentric and even dangerous. Ironically, by imitating gray hair, powder masked one's true age. 
Perfumers' accounts indicate that hair powder was almost always purchased together with pomade, an ointment for, made from apples, or palm in French, mixed with rendered fat, among other ingredients, which scented, conditioned, thickened, and set hair and wigs. Pomade was sold in pots and later sticks, which were better suited to the more complex hairstyles that came into vogue in the 1770s. Without powder, pomade would have been sticky and wet looking, and without pomade, powder would not adhere, adhere well. Powder was applied daily using large swan's down powder puffs. A mask kept powder off the face and out of the lungs, while a cloth or peignoir protected the clothes. But traces of powder would be visible along the hairline, as in the portrait it left, which likely depicts the sitter's own hair rather than a wig. Powder also tended to fall off and leave a faint dusting on a man's shoulders. This too can sometimes be seen in portraits, suggesting that it was not a sartorial faux pas, but a desirable proof of one's fashionability and youth. In the second half of the 18th century, powder bellows like this one permitted a more regular and less wasteful method of application. Even after white powder finally went out of fashion, men and women continued to use hair-colored hair powder for hygienic reasons. As fashionable wigs continued to shrink in the 1760s, more and more young men began to forego wigs and powder altogether, to the mutual horror of wig makers and balding and graying men. Here, Louis XVI wears a simple bag wig with two curls over each ear, a style called a pigeon's wing. But a wig really wasn't necessary for a man with a decent head of hair to achieve this look, which went hand in hand with the new fashion for slim fitting streamlined suits. As Europeans began to colonize warmer climates, men began questioning whether the once ubiquitous wig was really so essential after all. But wigs remained an essential element of formal dress, and it was considered sensational when Benjamin Franklin paid a diplomatic visit to Versailles in 1778, wearing his own stringy, graying hair. On a previous visit in 1764, Franklin had allowed a French tailor and perruquier to transform him into a Frenchman, as he put it. But when he returned to solicit France's support for the American Revolution, instead of blending in, he did his best to stand out, wearing plain wool suits and spectacles. He claimed that a scalp ailment made wigs uncomfortable. But in truth, his dressed down appearance was a calculated political move intended to reinforce the newly United States of America's reputation as a nation of unpretentious, freedom-loving farmers. Marie Antoinette's lady-in-waiting, Madame Campan, among others, noted how Franklin's straight, unpowdered hair, his round hat, and his suit of brown wool contrasted with the sequined and embroidered suits, the powdered and perfumed coiffures of the courtiers of Versailles. But far from offending his host, Campan testified, this novelty charmed all the French women. Gowns of Franklin Gray soon appeared in fashion magazines. Contrary to popular belief, women did not wear wigs in the 17th and 18th centuries, except in rare cases to conceal major hair loss. Remember, to wear a wig comfortably, you needed to shave your head. While men changed their wigs every year, female hairstyles evolved comparatively slowly over the course of the 17th century. Here is Louis' Spanish-born queen, after her extreme makeover into a chic French woman, her hair pinned up and back with ringlets artfully arranged around her face and falling on her shoulders, the standard hairstyle for women of the court. The Fontage headdress, a tower of lace supported by a wire frame and lace, with lace lappets trailing down the back, was named for the Duchesse de Fontage, who became Louis' mistress in 1679. The fashion outlasted the relationship. This anonymous print gives a good back view of the long lappets, and the rare surviving example is from the Bose Museum in England. By 1791, Louis was complaining that these Fontage headdresses had grown too high. They became narrower and more pointed until they looked almost like horns, mirroring the rising peaks of the male wig. The style persisted until around 1716. It was an excellent way to show off a lot of expensive handmade lace. By the middle of the 18th century, hair was worn close to the head, tightly curled and sometimes powdered, mirroring the more restrained men's wigs. This coiffure was called the tête de mouton, or sheep's head, and it was usually adorned with small hair ornaments called pom-poms, named for another royal mistress, Madame de Pompadour, on the left. This Sevres porcelain toilette service in the Wallace collection is thought to have been made for Pompadour, to replace the silver one she'd had melted down to help the king finance the Seven Years' War. 
It includes containers for powder, pomade, and a powder puff, and a small brush to dress, dust gray powder from her clothing. Women's hair grew steadily higher from 1760 onward. On April 26, 1774, the Parisian gossip rag, the Memoirs Seclette, noted the appearance of a curious new fashion dubbed the Pouf. As the Baroness Doberger explained, it was a coiffure in which one introduced the person or things one loved, thus the portrait of one's daughter, one's mother, a picture of one's canary, one's dog, etc. The whole thing trimmed with the hair of your father or a bosom friend. It was an unbelievable extravagance. This fashion plate dep depicts a coiffure à la charte, named for the stylish and immensely wealthy Duchesse de Chartres, the former Mademoiselle de Pontievre, who is represented by two portraits in the exhibition. She launched the trend with a poof depicting her infant son, his nurse, her pet parrot, her black servant boy, trimmed with the hair of her husband, her father on the left, and her father-in-law, all nestled in a mountain of powder and pomade. The Memoirs de Clet declared, all the women are mad about poofs and want to have one. Madame Campan observed, women could no longer find carriages high enough to sit in, and one often saw them tilting their heads or holding them out the window. Others chose to kneel down in order to manage the ridiculous edifices with which they were burdened in a safer manner. And Madame de Genlis remembered, we wore then not just flowers, but fruits, cherries, currants, strawberries. Art imitated these fruits so perfectly that it was hard to tell them from the real thing. Some women wore vegetables. One saw coiffures of artichokes and radishes, but this was more of a singularity than a fashion. Nevertheless, you can see carrots and other vegetables in the coiffure on the right. Intensely personal sentimental poofs, like the one devised for the Duchesse de Chartres, quickly gave way to so-called circumstantial poofs, inspired by current events. The correspondence Letterer described coiffures depicting, sometimes naturally, sometimes allegorically, the most important items in the newspapers. We see on one bonnet the opening of Parliament, on another the peace between the Russians and the Turks, or even an English garden. In short, all the great events, ancient and modern. These fashion plates portray a woman, often misidentified as Marie Antoinette, wearing the coiffure à la belle poule, inspired by America's struggle for independence, in which France was a key military and political partner. In 1778, France signed a treaty of alliance with the newly United States and sent its ships up against Britain's formidable Royal Navy. The Battle of Ushant on July 27th of that year was their first major conflict fought in the English Channel. Though the battle was not decisive and both sides would claim victory, the French fleet suffered far fewer casualties, and one French frigate in particular, the Belle Poule, ba badly damaged the British vessel, the Arethusa. All Paris was inflamed by the news, the Vicomtesse de Fah recorded, and for a month the ladies enshrined its memory with an object of fashion of bad taste called the coiffure à la Belle Poule. This represented more or less a ship in full sail. The Journal Politique marveled at its ingenious sales of gauze and riggings of silver and gold threads. A variant of the plate on the left was published under another title on the right, which made explicit its political context, the coiffure à la independence, or the triumph of liberty. Far from being the whimsical caprice of bored aristocrats, poofs advertised their wearers' patriotism and political acumen. Not only a woman's moods and interests, but her thoughts and opinions were declared in her hair. It was a powerful and highly visible vehicle for female self-expression. To create these non-wigs, a professional hairdresser, usually male, augmented his client's own hair with false curls, wire supports, cushions stuffed with horsehair or wool, much like today's extensions and buppets, before adding feathers, flowers, and other ornaments. A final layer of powder camouflaged this elaborate understructure and gave the head a smooth, uniform, and ageless appearance. The time-consuming nature of the hairdressing process is underlined by the whirlwind of activity taking place around the toilet table in the sub figurine. Women might receive visitors, read books, or write letters while their hairdresser worked. Hairdressing schools were opened and hairdressing manuals published to teach ladies' maids how to achieve the crucial height. On the right is a new kind of low-back swivel chair designed to facilitate the hairdressing process. This example, now in the Getty Museum, was once owned by Marie Antoinette. 
Fueled by the rise of fashion magazines, fashions in hair change even faster than fashions in clothes, and never more rapidly than between the 1760s and the 1780s. This posed great problems for portraitists. Long before Photoshop, a lady who wanted to look good for posterity was left with no option but to have her dated do painted out and replaced with a more contemporary coiffure. The portrait of courtesan Marie Rinteau on the right was originally painted in 1761, and the miniature copy at the left was made shortly thereafter. In about 1774, Rinteau had the artist update her outmoded hairstyle to reflect the poofs of the time, leaving her dress untouched. The miniature preserves the original coiffure. Similarly, some portraits of the 1770s had their poofs painted out in the 1780s when fashion changed again. Though women did not wear big wigs per se, they encouraged the perceived correlation between high hair and high status. As the painter Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun remembered of the court of Louis XVI, women reigned then. Louis did not have a mistress, so female power was concentrated in the popular and fashionable figure of the queen. The poofs of the 1770s and the lower but wider hairstyles and broad-brimmed hats of the 1780s took up physical and visual space, enhancing women's prominence. In addition, they were expensive. Men's wigs were available at a variety of price points, depending on their size, complexity, and the type of hair used. Furthermore, they could be worn over and over again, while women's coiffures had to be changed and maintained frequently. Big hair for both sexes finally went out of fashion with the revolution. Hair powder and wigs were deemed unnatural and even deceitful, as well as inappropriately luxurious. Here, a couple of the court of Louis XVI in poof and bag wig con confronts a streamlined, minimalist couple of the neoclassical directoire. Just skip to the end. On the right, David's stark sketch poignantly depicts Marie Antoinette with her famous hair shorn, covered by a simple bonnet on her way to her death on October 16, 1793. The woman who had been, been notorious for her elaborate hairstyles and extravagant dress was virtually unrecognizable without them. A female Samson stripped of not just her strength, but her very identity. Thank you. Thank you.